This is Epicenter, episode 378, with guests Alexis Selye and Eleftherios Diakamikalos. Hi, I'm Sebastian Cuccio, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're on a Mac or iOS device, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks Apple. And I'm speaking specifically to all of you who have started listening to the show in the last couple of months. With the bull market, our audience has gone up, and that tells me that there's a lot of new listeners. So do us a favor and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you haven't subscribed yet, you can do that on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Today, our guests are Alexis Sellier and Eleftherios Diakomikalis. They are the co-founders of Radical. Radical is a new platform that is changing the way that we collaborate around code. Right now, if you're a developer, there's a pretty good chance that you're using Git and GitHub. And GitHub is a centralized company. It's actually owned by Microsoft since the last little while. And one of the main criticisms of GitHub is that it is amassing all of this source code from public repos and also private repos. And that is a huge value for you know, the owners of GitHub. Radical aims to create a decentralized version of this. And of course, that has some really interesting implications uh, around how the system is structured and how communities are come together to decide what is the canonical uh, repo for a project. The other cool thing about Radical is that it closes the gap between decentralized governance and the canonical repo for a project. So take any blockchain that has a governance process built in for updating code, like Cosmos, for example. People make proposals there. The code gets uh, voted about whether or not it will make it into uh, the hub but someone still has to commit that code to the Cosmos repository. Now projects have figured out like their own ways and they've come, come together around their own ways to make sure that this is somewhat decentralized. But with Radical, you could actually connect this governance process directly to the process by which the, the repo gets uh, updated and the code commits get made. So this opens up a lot of potential, I think, for decentralized governance around not only blockchain projects, but just general code collaboration to emerge. Many of you have been using OneInch. In fact, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback about this sponsor, and it's no surprise because they're a great product. Um, it's my go-to DEX aggregator. I use it anytime I need to make a swap because I know that I'm getting the best price across DEXs and AMMs. So definitely check them out. You can do that at epicenter.rocks slash OneInch. That lets them know that we sent you. And with that, here's our conversation with Alexis Sellier and Eleftherios Diakomikalis. We're here today with Ellie and Alexis from Radical. Uh, I've known them for a long time, actually. I've, uh, Alexis briefly worked for a tenement in, that must have been 2017, I think. There yeah, briefly and then immediately started working on uh, on Radical, although at the time it was called OS Coin. And uh, yeah, so I've sort of followed this project on for a long time. I should also disclaim that I, I invested in the project kind of uh, back then. So it's, it's very exciting to see kind of like how far it's come. And now, uh, you know, there's actually something out there that allows people to collaborate on code. And, you know, we're going to go a lot into what that means and what sort of the vision for Radical is. So thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, let's start there. Like what, what is Radical and what's the vision you guys are pursuing? Yeah, Radical is a new kind of code collaboration network um, that is um, um, designed with certain goals in mind. Um, it's designed to be um, truly sovereign. It uses peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure behind the scene. Um, it's also designed with security in mind. And then finally, um, it, um, it brings together um, concepts like centralized organizations, you know, value flows, things, things that we see a lot in the 
in the in the in the block, blockchain ecosystem, it brings some of those closer to the code collaboration experience. And maybe just to kind of wrap our heads around a little bit, like why why is it important to have uh, code collaboration done in in a novel way, in a decentralized way? What's wrong with sort of the existing ways that's done? We we see a number of problems with uh, centralized uh, code collaboration providers. Um, the biggest problem and a hot topic right now in the world is the problem of user and project censorship. Unfortunately, most of the existing centralized providers basically, um, you know, have to um, limit usage to certain areas, um, like you know, Iran, Crimea. Like you know, there are a number of places in the world. So, so when we're thinking about open source being truly open, you immediately start to realize that there are all of these different arbitrary, you know, walls that come into play and that limit basically the openness of the of, of our open source infrastructure. So that's the first problem. Um, additionally, many of the centralized forges have not been designed with security in mind. Uh, the, you know, we can zoom in on that quite a lot, but the example that I always give there is that a few months ago, uh, there was this uh, significant hack on Twitter where some of the most, um, you know, mo most um, high profile um, accounts were compromised and then I think the attacker was basically tweeting some kind of, you know, Bitcoin, like send me Bitcoins type of link. Um, so imagine, you know, similar attacks on your code collaboration infrastructure uh, where someone potentially injects something in a very significant code base. And, you know, you as the maintainer of that project, potentially you wouldn't even be able to notice uh, simply because a lot of, you know, uh, commits on GitHub go uns unsigned, for example. And then additionally, you have like like when we're looking at decentralized forges, there are a number of attacks that are being pulled off on the on the social artifacts, not only on the code side of things. Uh, so secure our code collaboration and distribution of code bases. We think that it's a fundamental problem with centralized um, infrastructure. Uh, so censorship one, security second. Um, and then additionally, you have a number of other problems, like obviously vendor login. Um, uh, most of these uh, platforms today provide they, they speak Git, so they actually operate based on an open protocol, but they have engineered a number of things around those, the most common being um, social collaboration. Uh, and these obviously, you know, are locked into their own um, to, to their own platforms. These are the, the three things that we believe are really relevant for, for everyone. And then additionally, you have a number of, of problems that actually are uh, specific to the decentralized world. So uh, the decentralized world, especially last year, a lot of we saw we saw the emergence of a lot of DAOs, right? These are these are groups of people that actually go through the process of coordination and you know the pain of coordination many times to actually align incentives. And and what happens there is that actually like when they um, they they all of them usually you know have some kind of code repository like where the, where they store the code. Uh, most of these things are today on GitHub, and unfortunately uh, there they actually. They have to go through the classic admin flow of, of, of some of the centralized providers where, you know, it doesn't matter if you are a DAO, it doesn't matter if you have all of these very sophisticated coordination schemes, you need one admin that actually will have overarching power over, over, over the stats of the code base, or you might, like, you can have multiple ones, but actually in many ways this is even worse, uh, given that each and every one of them now has, has a lot of power over the community. So, so what Radical allows there is it allows uh, decentralized organizations, decentralized applications to control software repos trustlessly, uh, which we think is a very um, relevant point for them. Uh, finally, uh, there is a, an opportunity as well. Like today, most developers still you know, struggle with the problem of open source sustainability. This is, you know, has been a hot topic on the web for the last few years. Um, we personally think that blockchains enable new experiments around value flow. And what we're looking to do with Radical is to actually to bring them closer to the code collaboration experience and hopefully enable more humans to sustain their open source work and contribute to the comments. So yeah, a number of topics, but censorship, security, uh, vendor lock-in, uh, decentralized ownership, and then sustainability. These are the five problems that we see with centralized code collaboration platforms. Cool. So you guys were both at SoundCloud uh, at one point, and I think SoundCloud, uh, you know, I don't know 
need as much as you about this, but I think SoundCloud also had this kind of vision around, you know, collaborating and around creating music, distributing music and kind of like a, a different approach that was maybe a bit more like open and decentralized. In the end, it seems like they didn't really succeed there. And, you know, you had maybe more closed platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, etc., that ended up sort of winning. I don't know if that assessment's right, but I'm curious, like, what are your the lessons from from this, your time at SoundCloud or how that experiment has played out that have kind of, you know, informed your approach to a radical? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a great question, actually. And what's so interesting is that many of us that joined a lot of the Web 2.0 platforms early on, you know, the, the vision and the, the excitement was coming again from, you know, disintermediation, right? It's the same story. Like you basically, you were hoping in the music industry, like back then, you know, like we were hoping that we will be able to actually develop platforms, experiences, products that will enable create creators to actually own more of their creative process. Uh, and as you said, I think with SoundCloud, we really succeeded culturally. I believe that SoundCloud had like a really significant impact in the music industry, like really normalized things that were not, you know, the music industry didn't want to look at, like, like they were like, you know, like, I don't remember what was the official term, but, you know, it was kind of like gray, like, you know, like gray type of content, specifically thing about DJ mixes, covers, mashups, all of those things that now we believe that actually are normalized. But obviously we think that like, it failed, SoundCloud failed to actually, you know, truly like realize this disintermediation, right? So, you know, creators today are still customers of SoundCloud. They're not owners, <laughs> you know, SoundCloud. Like, and, and this is where crypto and the Web3 is very, very interesting for us simply because it has this promise of community owned and operated networks where you, you know, you know that no platform can actually get extractive against you. You can be the platform, right? So, um, yeah, that's, that's one thing that we really, you know, keep close to our hearts. And, you know, it's the North Star for, for some of the work that we're doing with, with Radical. How can we actually enable developers to have that power over the tools they use every day? One inch is a decentralized exchange aggregator that sources liquidity from the top DEXs and AMMs to save you money and time on swaps. OneInch finds the best possible trading paths across over 20 supported liquidity protocols and splits them up across multiple market depths. I started using OneInch last summer and since then it's become my go-to aggregator. I use it every time I need to make a swap. They recently launched V2, which has a brand new API. It greatly improves their routing algorithm. And my favorite part about the V2 is the new UI. It's super clean and easy to use. These improvements ensure that you get the best rates on your swaps with the lowest possible response time. So the next time you need to make a swap, forget about getting the best rate or optimizing your gas fees. Make it easy on yourself. Just use one inch and you can let them know that we sent you by going to epicenter.rocks slash one inch. That's one I-N-C-H. We'd like to thank one inch for their support of the podcast. So to dive in a bit now into like, you know, some of the features and visions that you, you talked about, so I guess my first question is when it comes to things like censorship resistance, what's the need to build like this as a protocol when, you know, rather than just promoting more competition at the service provider level? So, you know, GitHub is still the dominant platform, but there's also other like competition from, you know, other products like GitLab and SourceForge. And especially when it comes to like, you know, GitLab is open source and you can self-host it if you want. So what does Radical provide that like a self-hosted uh, system would not? So one of the problems with having um, sort of relying on multiple competitors or multiple platforms as a, as a way to um, reduce platform risk um, is that a lot of these platforms, uh, at least the famous ones, are in the same jurisdictions, right? And so they actually don't necessarily behave differently. Um, what I mean is if you have like a sort of like a political issue, for example, like we're seeing recently with, uh, you know, geo-blocking or uh, embargoes and things like that, it's very likely that all of the platforms will actually behave the same way, right? They will take the same steps, block the same users. Um, and so there, there isn't really any benefit in jumping from one platform to the other because you essentially end up in the same exact situation. And it's the same thing with, uh, 
you know, um, hosting or like cloud providers, et cetera, because they, they essentially end up all doing the same things and censoring exactly the same users in the end. Yeah. And, and, and to add on that, like if you really look at how these platforms are, are, are emerging and evolving, um, you know, what started as a place for hosting Git repos now has become the place where my life's work, you know, is and lives, right? And not only that, like now where, where this whole space is going is that where, this is where also where I make my income with things like GitHub sponsors, right? So you basically like, you know, take some of these problems that start as like, oh, my contribution is blocked or my account is blocked. And, you know, like looking at the trend and our reliance on some of the systems, you realize that in the future, you might be completely canceled because one of, this pro one of these platforms basically decided that they do not want to accept contribution from, from someone that visited Iran, but also your salary might be canceled, you know? And like, you know, you have all of these systemic, systemic risks that we don't, we really do not think that the web 2.0 was designed, you know, with those with those in mind. Um, so that's that's one thing. Yeah. And then on your second on the second part of your question about self-hosted instances, that's actually very interesting because um, indeed there are a number of providers. There's GitHub, GitLab, Kitea, um, like you know, SourceHat. There are many providers. All of them, you know, speak Git, and then many of them offer self-hosted instances. But what's really going on is that you know you are almost like confronted with this decision that either i go for convenience and connectivity right either i'm on the community edition of github and anyone can find me or i isolate right and i have control by running a self-hosted instance that basically you know no other like you know actor usually you know like can 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 access you don't have the network effects discoverability and all of that so radical basically tries to find a place in the middle uh, where you do not need to compromise your connectivity in order for you to actually, you know, be self-sovereign, right? And um, yeah, and that's what we think that we're adding to the mix. Yeah, maybe maybe to add to that, there's no um, global identity layer, essentially. If you go with a uh, self-hosted instance, your contributors are going to have to create a new account every time. So there's, yeah, there's really no social effects or network effects there. Yeah, and, and maybe to, to add one more thing, because this is an interesting one. Uh, there are attempts for a federated Git, like basically, like, yeah, you would say a federated Git network. If you search for that, you will find a number, a number of attempts there. You know, none of them has actually materialized yet. But, um, but even if they do, the problem we see with federated systems is that you always rely on, you know, like, okay, pick your sysadmin, great, okay, yes, I can move away from that instance, but, you know, your OPSEC is as good as, you know, your, you know, the practices of your sysadmin and, and also, like, based on evidence, like, you know, past evidence, we see that, again, you have the same centralization tendencies where, you know, one, one instance will become, you know, the canonical one, and then you have, again, the same the same issues with you know power and trust. So we really think that peer-to-peer -peer systems actually um, are an answer to this problem, and they are a much more preferred uh, way to to approach that. And that's why Radical is engineered as as one. So one of the things that like I think is also very different is not only are you guys like kind of focused on like the tooling, but also in this like larger process of open source development. And so you guys are very like. You know, a lot throughout your documentation, you always bring up this cathedral versus bazaar model. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that and then how that shapes the uh, what you guys are building? Yeah, so the cathedral and the, and the bazaar was uh, an essay um, by Eric Craven, if I'm not mistaken, um, where he talks about two kinds of development models, right? Um, one is the cathedral model where um, essentially you kind of have a sort of centralization um, around the repository and everyone kind of pushes and, and pulls um, from that repo and uh, some of the uh, now less used version control systems like um, SVN were built around that model, right? Um, and then the bizarre model is um, very different. It's much more peer-to-peer -peer, um, and you essentially don't really have a, a sort of canonical master or repository. Instead, you have many and they operate in a more peer-to-peer -peer way, as I said. Um, and Git was built for that model, right? And they obviously have pros and cons. Um, we, If we look at GitHub, that's definitely, definitely promoting the cathedral model because you have 
a single repository and you manage permissions, right? Like an access control list, um, team members can push and pull there and uh, there's an admin um, and that's the cathedral model. The, I, I guess the, the advantages obviously are that um, for small projects, um, it's a lot easier to manage, right? Because you have one place to look for, um, to, to, to pull from, to download from, um, and to manage, right? It's very easy to see what the latest commit is in such a repository. Um, but of course, you have, you have issues with that, um, for example, when it comes to scaling. Um, so um, to give a, an, a, a different example, the, the Linux kernel um, is managed in more of the bizarre model where you have a sort of hierarchy of maintainers um, that um, fetch and pull code from each other um, all the way up to Linus who um, you know, has a sort of trusted set of maintainers he pulls code from and merges, right? And so this, this model scales um, a lot better for that reason. Um, but of course, um, it, it can be a little bit daunting uh, to approach. In terms of a radical, um, since we were designing a peer-to-peer -peer system, we found that um, the bizarre model was a much more natural fit, essentially, and trying to shoehorn the, the sort of centralized uh, repo approach of GitHub would be very difficult. But one thing to keep in mind is for, uh, in, in the case of a single repository, uh, single maintainer, sorry. Um, so if you have a repository with only one maintainer, there really is no big difference, right? Because um, you do have a canonical place to pull code from. Um, and the maintainer is the only one who pushes to that repository, right? So in that case, it's the same. It gets more complicated when you have multiple maintainers and bigger projects. There, you're, you're sort of forced to appoint a sort of lead and to say like, okay, this, is, this maintainer will hold the, the latest or the canonical changes um, or state, um, whereas these other maintainers are going to um, you know, work with staging branches or whatever it is. So you have to have some kind of uh, out-of-band organization there. So do you think that like the tooling is a product of culture or is it more an input into culture? So what I mean by that is, you know, like you said, Git can be used in this very bizarre or cathedral model. Um, and then the tools like GitHub kind of nudge people towards using a cathe more cathedral-esque model. Do you think GitHub was designed this way because the culture and users demanded the cathedral model or was it like pushing people towards that? And then if you build this tooling for people to uh, develop in a more bizarre like model, do you think that will influence the culture and get more people and open source software to be developed in such a way? There's definitely a little bit of both. I think GitHub did have a huge influence on the way software is developed um, because even though, um, you know, it, it, it's not like the cathedral model was completely um, new, right? It, it was it was very much the way things were were working at the time, and perhaps you could say GitHub popularized it. But um, I think, in terms of radical and and the bizarre model, um, it's definitely it's definitely a model that is today a lot less popular, and that confuses some people. Um, and if we're going to be successful with a project, we're going to have to make that model more accessible, right? I think that goes without saying because there's something about the simplicity of GitHub where you have one place to look for changes, one place to manage permissions and uh, manage issues and everything. This is, uh, for, for people who are new to code collaboration, this is a lot easier, right, to explain and to work with. Um, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a little bit of, of learning and a bit of um, adapting from a user's, but... Um, I think we can influence things in that direction. So I, I'm wondering if you can explore, like, a, just explain this a little bit more. I, I mean, I, I, I understand the GitHub model on a high level, but like, let's say now you had a project that was developing in this more bizarre like way. Like, what does this actually like look like, and what are some of the tangible differences? in terms of, you know, maybe how the software is developed, how it's managed, how it's governed from following that different model. Yeah, sure. I, 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 can, I can give you an example. So 
Um, maybe one way to think about it is that um, on GitHub, you have a project that um, is not necessarily attached to a single user. It may be under a user account, but um, multiple users have right access to that project, right? Um, in Radical, um, for, for any given repository, there's only one user with right access to it. Okay, so the first thing is it's closer to what we call the GitHub open source model where you, you have to fork a repository to contribute to it via IPR, right? Um, so currently, so today already on GitHub, if you're working on open source or contributing to an open source project, you don't ask for right access, right? What you do is you fork the project, you make your changes, and then you open a pull request, and then the maintainer can merge those changes. So Radical is a lot closer to that, but um, you, uh, you can have multiple maintainers who can merge changes, right? So one of the, the core differences is that you have to settle on what you want to be the canonical repository. And for something like Linux, as I mentioned, um, Linux's kernel tree is the canonical one, right? And everyone knows this. Uh, when you have a Linux distribution like Arch Linux or uh, Red Hat, um, they will usually pull from his tree, source tree, to, um, to release a new version of the operating system, right? And this is known. And um, the same thing applies uh, for Radical. So you have to figure this out within the team, within the community for any given project that um, a certain user's um, source tree is the one that is considered canonical. Um, that, is the, that is the main difference. Now, we, we are working, for instance, and we're going to talk about this a bit later, I think, but about how Ethereum, for instance, could help um, with figuring out a canonical tree, right? Because um, in the Ethereum world, you have a global database, essentially, and there you can uh, mimic some of GitHub's behavior where you can say, okay, this is uh, this user, uh, this user's um, tree is the canonical one. Um, this is where you push and pull from, right? But yeah, in the pure peer-to-peer -peer model, this is something that needs to be decided per project, essentially. So I'm, I'm still having some trouble understanding then what's the difference. If there's still one canonical version of the repo which is you know whether it's linus's what well, what's actually the tangible difference then like it is it just that there's more you know brand there's almost like sub masters where like you know uh instead of like getting merging everything to like the main master branch you know we have a bunch of like sub branches that we're merging to those and then eventually those it's more of a tree rather than like you know a single hub and spoke system but like I'm not fully understanding what makes this that much less hierarchical than you know the traditional model that's used today. So maybe one way to think about it that that could be helpful is that um, in Radical, a project, right, which is the the kind of unit of collaboration in GitHub, it's called a repo. We call it a project. In Radical, a project is not um, owned by a user. So this is this is kind of so. On, on GitHub, if you look at, um, you know, whatever, the, the Bitcoin project, it's under the Bitcoin organization, right? So it's owned by the Bitcoin organization, right? In Radical, um, a project like Bitcoin would be um, sort of self-sovereign in a sense, or like it, it wouldn't have a, an owner per se. It wouldn't be under a certain user account necessarily, right? Um, what it would have is one or more maintainers, right? And you could say, oh, if there's one maintainer, it's kind of like the owner, right? Um, which that, that could work, as I said. But now let's say there's 12 maintainers, right? Um, you have this project with a bunch of maintainers. There is no um, immediate indication of who owns this or where you can find it, basically. Um, so it's, it's, it's a subtle difference, but it, it means that projects essentially are um, sort of self-standing or like free-floating, you could say. And, and to add on that for like maybe the less technical user. So on, on GitHub, you land and immediately have this concept of main or master, right? Which, you know, this is like the, the state of things right now. Like, and, you know, GitHub basically makes that very easy for you. In Radical, every project actually needs to go through this coordination phase of like agreeing on what's the 
canonical state of things for a newcomer. You know, you, you land on a project, you are like, okay, how do I know what is, you know, the latest here? So there's this coordination step that obviously, you know, we try to make this very simple for you. So, you know, imagine like a little label that says like Sunny's, Sunny's branch is the canonical branch here, right? Uh, so so that's that's one difference. The second, the second difference with something like GitHub is that on GitHub you land um, on the project and then you can you can see basically like you can see all branches, right? Because they have a global database behind things. Um, in, in Radical, you need to be more explicit about that. You need to be more explicitly request on the peer-to-peer -peer network that I'm interested in Brian's branch and, and Sunny's branch uh, around this project. Um, and of course, again, you know, th there are ways where we can make this a lot simpler for you uh, by using something that we call seed nodes, which are kind of like pinning nodes on IPFS or, you know. Um, but yeah, these are two, two immediate differences that, you know, no master or main, you need to coordinate on a per project basis. And then the second thing is that not access to all the data. This is a peer-to-peer -peer network, so you need to be explicit about which views within the project you actually want to replicate. So we've kind of touched in, the, in a few ways now, right? You mentioned in the beginning, okay, this idea of allowing decentralized organizations controlling software repos. You know, we now kind of talked about, you know, different branches having, uh, you know, which one's the canonical one. Also, the idea of like maintainers, right? And the role of maintainers uh, came up. I mean, for me, probably you know the, the place where this topic became was most kind of came most to my attention was like years ago in Bitcoin. There was a lot of controversy about you know where the project uh, should go, and you know I think for example the block size was was one thing. Uh, and actually a lot of that controversy then ended up playing around, you know, what kind of things get merged into the, the core BitCup repo, who's the maintainer of that, right? And then you had certain people being removed there. You ended up having people making forks and, you know, but then you, of course, you had the shelling point around, you know, there is this one GitHub repo that people know as the Bitcoin GitHub repo. So if I just fork it, then it's very hard to get people to go around that, right? So you ended up having this almost uh, accidental kind of point of control uh, over Bitcoin that ended up being with decentralized software uh, and and the maintainers there. So I'm curious if you, yeah, I can like expand a little bit, talk a little bit about that and talk a little bit about how, you know, how in a sort of radical based development world this would look like yeah interesting um yeah so 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 bitcoin basically uh i think it was a couple of years ago it, it uh, forked into bitcoin cash right and then um bitcoin sv a little bit later that was a fork of bitcoin cash and now there's three um separate um or at least three separate um instances of the project um with different maintainership and, and goals and everything um, I think one of the important things there is to differentiate between the different kinds of forks that exist um, in software collaboration, right? There's a, uh, there's a different intent if you're trying, if you're forking with the intent of merging those changes back in versus forking um, with the intent of never merging the changes back in because you have diverging goals, right? And so those were definitely the latter. Um, whereas on, on GitHub, when you create a fork of something, um, it's also used as a way to merge changes back in to upstream, right? So in the radical world, um, we have something called a project ID um, for each project. And these are, it's essentially a hash of some metadata around the project. And if you are intending to make changes to a project that you intend to be merged back in, um, the kind of fork you would create would, would preserve the original project ID, right? So you would essentially create a, you know, just a new branch on the same project, publish that, and then you would intend that to be merged back in. If on the other hand, you're intending to do a fork like Bitcoin Cash, um, you would actually um, create a completely new project identity for that, right? It, it could have the same code, the same history, but its identity uh, would be different. The hash would be different. 
the maintainer would be different, um, the description of the project might be different. And so it would have a different identity and then these projects could no longer be merged back into one essentially through the, the, the default radical tooling, of course. So I think beyond that actually, um, there's not that much difference with what happened on GitHub. Um, what I mean is you, in, in both cases, you have a bunch of maintainers that um, are sort of in control of a project or repository. And in both cases, there is either an intent to diverge or to converge towards the same goal. I think the, the only thing maybe worth, worth saying that, that is interesting with Radical is the um, maintenance of that project identity, right? So the, uh, the, it's essentially a, a file um, which has the project description, the list of maintainers, um, and a bunch of uh, other data. The maintenance of that file is, goes through um, a quorum, so um, a, a vote uh, in a way. Um, so if you have more than one maintainer uh, for a project, let's say you have three maintainers, then to change the project identity, um, you need two signatures, two out of three signatures in that case, right? And this is something that perhaps would be helpful in this situation because you would have a clear um, governance model around that at least um, compared to GitHub where you have um, a sort of super admin that can remove other admins and can never be removed. And then you have a bunch of maintainers or admins who, who have almost all of the power of the super admin except the, the ability to remove the super admin. And so there you have a, a, a less well-defined um, structure, I would say, compared to Radical. Yeah, and, and maybe, maybe Brian, to add on that, like, and I'm actually gl I'm, I'm glad you asked because as of two weeks ago, uh, one of the core maintainers of Bitcoin Core basically started experimenting with Radical. So actually, if you go on Radical, you will be able to find the Bitcoin Core repo today. Yeah, like, and he also wrote a blog post about how they planning on basically decentralizing their process. And they mentioned a number of steps there. And, and, and they also, you know, talk about Radical. And specifically, they talk a lot more about this whole idea of vendor looking, like, you know, sp specifically, like, um, the mentioning the fact that like, hey, we can like, we can jump to the next platform, you know, but like, you know, now basically we have all of our social artifacts, you know, locked, locked in, in that platform. Uh, so, so playing the Bitcoin core, core uh, scenario, like, you know, what would Bitcoin core win from being on Radical? Number one, you know, they would rely on a peer-to-peer -peer network. They won't have to rely on any company for the distribution of the Bitcoin core repo. This is a truly peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, right, so so you have basically global available, like you have better availability um, around that. That's one thing, um, and then um, the the second thing you have is that in Radical, basically the social artifacts live within the Git object, right? So that's what we mean on the website when we're basically talking about build on open on open protocols, not platforms, including your social your social artifacts. Basically, no corporation owns them; they can actually move like they can move them away without actually having to you know worry about that so that's the second thing that they immediately uh win um and then you know basically censorship com comes with that and then finally the the thing that alexi mentioned which in radical you have this delegation scheme around around the repo so for certain critical operations you know you have to go through some kind of you know uh like vote you can think of it as a multi-sig you know you, you can think of it in many ways but uh that that is much more secure uh rather than actually oh it happened that i was the first one that created this project i'm the super admin of that now basically like you know i might go rogue which happened for example on i think the reddit the Reddit community, uh, like there's a famous story around Bitcoin there where, you know, on the fork, they decided to keep the name, the ceiling point, but actually change the content, right? So, you know, this type of things, basically, you can deal much better with them in Radical. So when it comes to the social stuff, there have been like past systems which have like incorporated social features into the Git repo itself rather than this like external thing. Are you guys making use of some of the existing ones or is this something you guys have like developed from scratch? And if so, is there anything new that's not in the like, you know, existing solutions? Uh, yeah, so we're, we're, we're in the process of developing these right now. And, and the two main ones obviously are um, 
pull requests or merge requests, um, and the other is issues, right? In terms of issues, um, which, which we're going to work on a little bit later, um, there is one very good solution that allows issues to be managed within Git um, called Git Bug, right? It's, um, it's uh, a tool, I think, built in Go, um, and um, it essentially stores issues as Git notes, from what I remember, um, which is a, a feature, a native feature of Git. Uh, so it's very possible that we end up adopting that and, and build a front, building a front end on top of it, because um, our replication system um, just replicates uh, the Git tree, right? It doesn't really care what objects are in there; it will just replicate whatever is necessary. And so we would we would essentially get that for free. In terms of pull requests or our, our equivalent, the kind of the, the very basic way of doing that um, is really just a way to signal that. A branch you've created is uh, meant to be merged back in, right? So it's really just branch plus intent of merging, right? Um, and and for that we have our own system that we're we're working on, that is um, that is really really simple actually. What comes after that is code review, of course, and that's that's a, a massive undertaking. Um, you know, GitHub has been working on code review on their on their code review flow for years, and it. it New features come out every every month or every year or whatever. So that's a more complicated one. We don't have any plans on using an existing system yet, although we are taking some inspiration from Garrett, uh, namely uh, in terms of how how the the code is structured, how the the code is proposed to be merged, etc. Because GitHub does have some limitations there um, in terms of the. Um, uh, the history of changes that are often lost or overwritten when there's a force push, for example. So we are trying to make some improvements there, but otherwise uh, it, it's looking like we're going to have to create our own system for that. I, I did want to actually ask just a, a sort of follow-up to the to previous thing. So like today, like you have a lot of new blockchains that have on-chain governance or people create like DAOs or the, you know, these organizations like kind of collectives on chain and you know, as you guys pointed out before often there's like some sort of code repo generally on github right that sort of manages this code that's used by this uh on chain uh project and then of course you do have to challenge right that let's say there is some kind of you know to give cosmos as an example right there's some sort of like cosmos governance thing on like oh do this with uh you make this kind of change but then the, co the, the software we was actually decoupled from that. And, you know, the, the on-chain governance can't enforce, you know, the change on, on GitHub. So how, how is that going to work with Radical? And can you, like, how, to what extent can you couple those things so that it's really kind of the, the on-chain governance that directly controls, you know, changes to the software repo? And is, is that actually uh, desirable? Yeah, uh, so that, that's a great question. Uh, maybe I think that's, that's a good segue to basically say a few words about the Radical architecture because I don't think that we said anything yet. Um, so Radical is three components conceptually. There is the peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, which is a peer-to-peer -peer network organized around Git. Um, and the main innovation we're bringing to the mix is introducing the social overlay around Git repos that looks a lot like secure scuttlebutt uh, I think you, you you had Dominic here maybe a few months or, or, or years ago. Um, so there's a peer-to-peer -peer network that you actually use for most of your code collaboration needs. You do not need to interact with the blockchain, you know, like you don't need to hold any tokens or anything like that. Uh, you know, it's available for everyone for free, right? And this is where, you know, you basically live most of the time. Um, and so that's that's layer one. Layer two is basically clients, right? And we what we've done already is we developed a client that we call upstream that acts as the main user interface you download this locally and we already uh, support mac and linux and we actually spending quite a lot of time on try to build beautiful experiences around code collaboration we realized especially you know for new developers this is very important and github has been very you know like impactful in that front so that's the second layer and then the third layer is what we call our Ethereum integration, the Ethereum layer. And this is an opt-in layer. You do not need to use this if you don't want to. And, you know, there are a lot of developers that actually, you know, like do not like blockchains. Some of them do not like Ethereum, right? Like you have the maxi wars and all of that. 
but what the blockchain gives us, it fundamentally it gives us three things. The one thing that it gives us is uh, canonicity, right? So you can think of the blockchain as a global database, right? And canonicity is very important for things like global names, for example, and discoverability, right? Like, you know, GitHub has been so significant, like because of how easy it is to pass repos around and all of that. So, so we covering that through a blockchain and we actually developing a registrar that is compatible with the Ethereum name service, uh, ENS. So that's one thing that we believe that will actually, you know, help, help a lot with discoverability and network effects. Uh, the second thing is we actually leveraging um, all the nice tooling that Ethereum has around decentralized uh, autonomous organizations or governance, right? So uh, we mentioned before that you on the peer-to-peer -peer layer, you already have a, a method to coordinate uh, based on a quorum, but that's actually quite limited. If you want more, if you want more sophisticated coordination schemes, then you can actually use like all sorts of existing DAO frameworks on Ethereum to coordinate around what's the canonical takeoff of your repo. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing that we really, we, we use Ethereum for is specifically around value flows. When we started the project, you know, we had two goals. One goal was develop resilient infrastructure for software developers. And then the second goal was to actually enable more developers to, to make a living for their open source work. Uh, and there, what we're trying to do is we try to basically use cryptocurrencies in order to basically help developers keep contributing to the commons. And we have a number of experiences that that come there. Uh, but the Ethereum layer is actually completely opt-in, right? So when you're thinking about the radical architecture, these are the three things. Now, moving to your question about, about governance. So we see this a lot from our users already. This is one of the most requested uh, features we have, which is, I have a DAO, you know, I'm um, this like well-known DeFi protocol. I have a DAO and I want to coordinate on what's the canonical state of things here through my DAO. I do not want to actually trust, uh, you know, the, the, an admin on GitHub. And we've been working with a number of teams that have been showing us what to do. And it's actually quite fascinating, actually, you know, what, what they do today. Like many of them maintain multiple GitHub organizations that pretty much mirror the same thing to go around the, <laughs> the admin flow of GitHub. And then also many of them like regularly hash manually things on IPFS to make sure that, okay, there is that too. And then they, uh, they use their own website as the ceiling point for coordination. And then on your own website, you will basically say, these are my repos. This is, you know, the latest of that, right? So, so Radical really, you know, if you have a DAO, it allows you to uh, coordinate um, and to decide on like, you know, what is the canonical state of things through the coordination mechanism of your DAO. And then additionally, the second thing that we're very excited about is if you do not have a DAO and you are on the peer-to-peer -peer network and at some point you want the equivalent of a GitHub organization, what we do is we basically deploy a DAO for you on Ethereum and we're demonstrating you why, you know, multisigs or, you know, even token-based schemes are actually much more powerful than, you know, the classic admin flow that, that GitHub gives you. Uh, so, again, you know, we try to give tools to developers. We do not try to force a solution to everyone. You know, certain communities prefer to operate based on a benevolent dictator, and that's absolutely okay, and you can do this in Radical. Other communities basically would want some coordination on the peer-to-peer -peer layer, and then you have, obviously, the decentralized world, like, you know, the Web3, that where DAOs right now are being really normalized and seeing a lot of, a lot of usage. We're also allowing them to control repos trustlessly. And and maybe I can I can dive a little bit in, in more detail on how this looks like in the product because we're we're actually working on this right now. I talked a little bit about you know having multiple maintainers on a project and you know the bizarre model where you have multiple peers. And in in the, the application in the, the upstream client, you can essentially you know switch between different source trees based on which peer you're interested in, right? Uh, in the network. So you, let's say. Um, you're uh, looking at the Radical project itself and you're like, oh, I'd like to see, you know, LA's, um, LA's source tree. I'd, I'd like to explore that. I was like, oh, I'd like to see Clouded source tree. And you can, so you can switch between the different um, source trees that you have available for a given project, right? Now, orgs, um, as we're developing them right now, are basically going to work the same way uh, in the sense that you'll be able to switch your view of a project to the org's view, to the org source tree, right? So it'll work just like another remote or another view of a project, um, except this view will be 
decided based on rules that are encoded in Ethereum, as Ellie said, right? So, you know, if, if, the, if, it's, a, if it's a multi-sig org, um, then a, a multi-sig um, transaction will be executed, which will decide what the, the official org view of this project should be. And then when you're browsing the project, you can switch to that view and look at what the org has essentially anchored on chain and, and notarized. So when you said, like, you know, look at LA's source tree, you know, we mentioned earlier that, like, you know, repos or projects don't really have owners. So what does that mean to, like, look at someone's source tree? Would it just be, is it just more looking at a fork of the source tree that happens to have, like, LA as the sole writer? But it's not, like, his tree, right? And so then he could, like, take his fork and, like, add more maintainers to it. Like, so I could convert my fork into something that will then, you know, eventually transition to being owned by an Ethereum DAO, for example? Yeah, I, I, I think you, you got it right. So every peer or user on the system has full ownership over their own source tree or fork, right? It doesn't mean they have ownership over, over the project, right? Which I, as I said, is owned by the maintainers or the, or the single maintainer. So each maintainer, each contributor, each you know, person who wants to just sort of have their own copy of a certain project will have their own source tree, right? And then it's a question of trust, right? It's like, if I trust Sunny, then I will follow Sunny's source tree, right? And be able to browse it, right? And maybe base my changes on or, or build um, Sunny's code into an executable, right? Because I, because I trust it. So um, it's all about trust. And obviously maintainers have a special status in the project. So you may want to um, you know, base your changes on their tree. But for, for what I mentioned for orgs, it's the same thing. If you, if you don't trust the org, then, then this is not giving you any new feature, right? It's not interesting to look at the org's view on a, on a project. But if you do trust the org because, um, you know, it's, this project was created by this org, for example, then that's something you would be really interested in having as your kind of default view on a project, for example. I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is like how what the difference here is between this and the GitHub model where it just turns into like, you know, this project is still owned by this org and like, what's different here then if, you know, you were saying like, okay, this DAO is this like maintainer that has the right to change it. How is this any different? It's hard to, to wrap your head around, but basically, you know, on GitHub, a project is under a user or under an org. Um, and only under that user or that org, right? So if, you know, the, the Tendermint code base is under the Tendermint org, it cannot also be under Cloudhead or under Sunny, right? That would be a, a, a essentially a different fork of that project with a separate issue list, and right? Um, so there is a sort of canonical place where it lives, right? Under a certain hierarchy. In Radical, that isn't the case, right? So the, the Tendermint project doesn't live under the Tendermint org. You know, the Tendermint org may have anchored um, a certain view of that project on chain and say, this is, this is Tendermint, right? But another org like Cosmos or Tendermint 2 or whatever could do the same thing, right? And it just depends on which org you trust and you will want to follow that org and that org's view of the project. Does that make more sense? Yeah, I think so. One question I have then about like the development process is, what what are your thoughts on how the how will this affect UX? So you know, I I have like friends in college still who are still learning computer science, and for them, you know, learning Git is always one of the most complicated things, and like this seems to make it like even more complicated. Like, and like you know, one of the things that having these like master repos helps is it like also provides a canonical ordering. Meanwhile, if like everyone's like merging in patches from other people and like this, like, you know, very secure scuttlebutt, like, you know, swarm like way. Won't this cause like all these like nightmares when it comes to things like rebasing? Because like, you know, I'm, you know, different people are merging in other people's uh, code base changes in different orders. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, you, you, you know, we, we said um, earlier that, um, you know, oh, like it, it's actually not that different from GitHub in, in a lot of ways. But this this point that you just brought up is what makes it actually quite different, right? Because um, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, you have this sort of 
inherent subjectivity, right? Where you don't have a full picture of the network. You, you see what you're connected to, what is available to you. You don't see everything like you would on GitHub, right? So problems like, uh, you know, things like merge conflicts could happen more often than in a GitHub model, um, especially uh, if you have multiple maintainers, right? Because this is a case where, um, you know, you, you, as a, as a contributor, you want to contribute some changes. You pick, uh, one of the maintainers branch as the, the starting point to branch off of. You, you, uh, create some changes, but it so happens that a different maintainer had a more recent copy of the repository, right? Um, and, and, uh, that's not something you knew because, you know, you're, you're not connected to that maintainer. And so there you would have a problem that would not have arise on GitHub where there's only one place to look at for the most recent change, right? And there, there's, there's a couple of things we're doing to improve that because it's, it's kind of inherent to peer-to-peer -to -peer networks um, because you, you have this uh, asynchrony, right? One of the things we're doing, um, Ellie mentioned it a little bit earlier, um, is to have these seed nodes. And seed nodes are um, a little bit like, um, like pubs and SSB or very much like pubs and SSB. They're essentially um, regular peers but um, that are publicly available and always online, right? And this, this acts a little bit like a, um, a point of coordination where there would not normally be one, right? So um, if you think of a completely peer-to-peer -peer network, it's kind of messy, right? And you can have these, uh, these problems with availability and merging and everything. But if you think of a peer-to-peer -peer network that is um, supported by some nodes that are sort of points of coordination, it, the picture looks a little bit different because a, um, a maintainer or a project can say, hey, um, we get all of our changes from this seed node. Maybe it's a community node. Maybe it's our own node. Maybe it's you know, deployed by the maintainers. It doesn't really matter, but it's, it's just a server where um, you can push data to and pull data from. Um, and this really uh, mitigates a lot of the, the problems with uh, um, ordering, essentially. One last DevX question I have is, for me, I actually do all my development on my laptop. I don't have like a desktop or anything like that. And one thing that GitHub provides is this like, you know, always online storage and like available for anyone to pull from. How do you uh, imagine like solving, providing these sort of services to users? Are you guys going to work with like, you know, any of the, you know, there's a bunch of like blockchain storage projects like, you know, Filecoin and Saya and whatnot, or do you guys have some other solution in mind for this? That's an interesting question. I think um, on the one side, the, the experience is local first, right? So it means like all of the things you're working with, all of the artifacts and everything is on your machine. So on the one side, you can, you know, sort of work as you would usually, whether or not you're connected to the internet, right? Um, what's going to happen is if you push a change that you want others to see, um, you know, it'll go through, but only once you reconnect to the internet or once you connect to um, certain nodes will those changes be replicated, right? The seed nodes function as uh, data availability nodes. So this is one sort of uh, way we can increase uh, uh, re the replication factor of a certain project. And individual peers also work as uh, replicators, right? So um, if you, um, again, just like the, the Scuttlebutt model, if you follow me um, or my project and I push a change, you're going to replicate that change and you will be able to um, broadcast it to other peers and actually serve that content to other peers, even if I'm offline. And so by default, I start to like host the data of everyone who's like working on the same project as me? You have to add the, uh, the peers you want to follow and replicate for now. So it's an explicit action. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so, so what, what happens is that basically, you know, you have this social overlay, we call this, right? Like we, where you basically communicate intent around, I'm interested in this repo, so I'm going to track that. Right. And then I'm also, you know, like I actually like Alexi's work or I trust Alexi, so I'm going to follow him. Um, and then you have the social network that is basically emerging around that. And then, and then by design, you replicate and you propagate in the network uh, things around the repos and the users you're, you're interested in. 
to add something to your to your question uh, to your previous question we're also working on multi-device support which is something that you know you, you mentioned that github provides that for you today so this is something that we understand that for a lot of users this uh, a real you know use case and we're working on that and then in terms of like you know permanence uh, which was you know your, your your question we're not really you know going beyond our peer-to-peer -peer network yet although you know we continue to just monitor the space like this you know it's, it's still quite early like i don't know if you you know how much you you have used most of the decentralized storage providers but you know it's still quite early but you know like both filecoin like saya like arweave swarm like they all progressing quite fast we think that at some point they will be more usable so you can imagine again like you know an integration around um you know certain in certain seed nodes for example right like they take care of that so that's something that we're not working on, but we're keeping an eye on to, to see how the space will uh, will converge. Um, and then what we really think that's going to happen is more what happened with IPFS and pinning nodes. So you, we, we think that basically, like as, as Radical is seeing traction, then there will be certain providers uh, that will basically say, hey, you know, pay me like, you know, a few, a few uh, dollars or a few crypto dollars. <laughs> and basically, like, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of that for you. Um, so, but, you know, we're not on our side, we much more focused on making the peer to peer and the end user, the peer to peer network, the end user experience and the blockchain integrations uh, work instead of actually like trying to offer some of these things ourselves. Will this social overlay provide like some sort of hurdles as well, though? So like, isn't one of the beauties of open source that I can like, go to a GitHub repo that I don't know anything about the maintainers. I could be anonymous for all they know, um, and I can still open an issue or you know provide a PR. But if there's this like manual peering that's required, how, doesn't this almost you know provide this like higher barrier to entry for people to collaborate? It does. Uh, it absolutely. It absolutely does. Like our solution to this is again seed nodes, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that. You know, you have these always own nodes that appear, and and what we think that's going to happen there is that they're going to have their own policies. You know how they go about replicating data, right? And then, um, and then additionally, you, you as a user, you can also, you know, uh, eventually you will be able to configure how many degrees out you want data to propagate, right? So you have this basically control switches, leverages that you you know you can tune in to your own experience and um yeah this is this is definitely though like the point absolutely stands you know it, it is about it is a higher barrier to entry but also we think that there are ways around that and alex i don't know if you want to add anything on that yeah maybe one one point on that is that um the the social overlay doesn't have to be the same for all kinds of artifacts on the network so what i mean is maybe you're replicating that maybe that the, the peers and the source trees you're replicating are chosen manually, right? Um, but you can be open to receiving pull requests from any user, um, as long, of course, as you are aware of those changes, right? So since um, the, the radical network is essentially a gossip network, things of interest are, are broadcast um, and, and essentially flood the network in that way. Um, and so peers get to know about a lot of things that they're not necessarily interested in. Um, like, oh, you know, peer X created new branch Y, you know, and it's like, oh, well, I'm not tracking this project. I'm not following this project, so I don't care about that, but I still know about it, right? And so I think for things like, like issues being open by, you know, some anonymous uh, contributor or PRs or things like that, um, maintainers could, could choose a policy where it's like, hey, if I receive a PR for, um, one of my own projects from uh, someone I don't know, I'm at least going to forward that to the client so that then, you know, the, the maintainer can, can look at it and either discard it if it's spam or, um, or actually, you know, look at it and merge it if it's not spam. But one thing to keep in mind is going the other direction with a more like, uh, let's say, uh, promiscuous policy um, where everything is sort of visible and, 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 uh, and replicated could lead to the opposite problem where, um, yeah, you have, you know, Sybil attacks and spam issues and uh, abuse and things like that. And so it's kind of, um, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a line to, to, to tread, given that there's no sort of like moderators or moderation in the network, apart from individual user blocking or following. 
Okay, let's let's move to I think the last uh, the last thing you guys mentioned in terms of you know what what radical is providing, and I think you mentioned that sort of in the in the context of open source sustainability. Another phrase I've seen in I think uh, some presentation of yours that like you know, I think it's a nice a nice way of sort of uh, looking at it is dev buy so developer finance. Uh, you know, I guess sort of a play on the, the, the current DeFi uh, hype or, or boom. So can you just like what, the, let's say Radical succeeds, what does that change in terms of, you know, business models around open source? Uh, yeah, the sustainability of, you know, open source development. That's a great question. So, yeah, like then <laughs> the the... You know the the DeFi thing is more of a meme internally for now, but like we'll see. You know if this you know catches on. Uh, so, but yeah, like talking about sustainability today, like the the solutions that developers have are um, again you know mainly constrained on platforms first of all, and then in terms of the solutions you have are very limited, right? So you have a small minority, like it's a small market around bounties. So bounties is one model uh, that you see. Uh, you see in the in the industry the second model that now is getting more attention because of github is the patreon model you know patreon slash github sponsors uh, slash open collective and i'm simplifying things there are some small differences between each and every one of those but um you know you can think of this more like the donation type of model uh with a bit of in exchange of something right uh, so that's the second thing and then the third model that you have is is um really like the okay, start a company, right? And then if you start a company, then what can you do? Usually if you want to continue developing open source, then you do open core most of the times, right? Which it is the model that, for example, uh, you know, GitLab is using and a lot of different providers use. And the idea here is that you have an open source code base at, at the center, and then you develop, you know, paid features around that. And, you know, it could be paid features, it could be consulting, you know, this again, again, ranges, right? And then you also have the software as a service type of thing that, you know, you you subscribe to some kind of community edition. This is, you know, where the world is today. Um, and um, what we really think is that, you know, blockchains fundamentally, you know, like bring an innovation around value, right? Like, and that's why we think that, Right now, the current thread with DeFi makes a lot of sense simply because, you know, you just have this new um, playground to just design new, you know, financing models and and, and new value flows uh, while also, you know, um, doing this in a, in a trustless way. So what we're looking to do is we're looking to um, introduce a number of these experiences. We really think that, you know, this is not the right time to just say this is going to be the model. There are like, when we look at the 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 developer space, we see a number of different ones, and I'll mention some um, that we think are interesting ones. Uh, so the first thing that we're working on is is a um, something that we call radical lists, and 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 this is basically a social experience around giving. The way that it works um, is you as a uh, as an open source supporter, you can set the budget and you can say I'm interested in supporting open source with one thousand die or you know another stablecoin and then um, what you can do is you can actually start curating um, a context context specific lists for example you know like a on one prototype you know we have vitalik curating a list of east 2.0 researchers or the best projects in east 2.0 for example and then now what you start doing is you basically start streaming uh, your funds towards you know your lists and Additionally, anyone that basically lands on your profile can actually now see that these are the lists that you have curated and then also start supporting you. So it's a little bit like if you know um, awesome lists like awesome React or awesome Python, you can like, you know, these this things that live on GitHub that developers curate a set of resources. Now you can imagine the same thing with money, where basically you can have, you know, the best projects within the Cosmos ecosystem. And then now anyone can actually see them, pass them around, support them, right? And, and you can basically uh, support these projects. So this is one of the things that we're doing, which is more specific on the donation side of things, but we're making it much more social as an experience. Um, the second thing that we're doing, which is which we think is interesting, uh, is we're designing a feature that we call back an issue. So it's a bit like you know GitHub meets Kickstarter. So uh, within within your uh, issue tracker, uh, you will be able to actually uh, like have issues 
uh, associated with value, right? Like where you can say you as a maintainer, you can say that like, hey, I'm only going to work in this issue if you, um, if you, if my my supporters basically pull together one thousand I, right? Uh, and in addition to that, again, because we're using blockchains and we think that blockchains are a better tool for aligning incentives, <laughs> what we do is you can you can have schemes where. For example, 50% of the funds are released up front and 50% after a milestone has been reached and the backers say, yay, you know, this has been uh, met or nay, right? While today on existing platforms is all or nothing because of the, you know, of, of, of the way the, the technology they use works. So on Kickstarter, all the funds are released up front, right? So you can engineer it like, and you can engineer this in a, in a, in a very flexible way. Um, so that's that, these are the two things that we're actually starting with. now. Additionally, like there are a number of other things that are going on in the space that we really like and we're keeping an eye on. For example, this year you see a lot of attention around uh, non-fungible tokens on Ethereum, right? Uh, so um, we have a number of ideas about non-fungible tokens where you know you as a supporter, for example, you know you support an open source project in exchange, you get a non-fungible token. Uh, and within the experience now, you have a special status, like a bit of, like you can think of it as a special badge. Uh, and then additionally, you have certain functionality within the repo. For example, imagine, you know, only your supporters will be able to actually prioritize your issue tracker, uh, or potentially only your supporters might be able to access an issue tracker, for example, right? So there are all of these, you know, like interesting experiences that, that bringing value closer to the code collaboration experience now these are now like available. So, so we're looking at uh, introducing some of them. And then maybe the final one that we're looking, we're not doing anything yet. There is obviously this whole idea of social tokens. It's, it's quite interesting because, you know, we've been, we've been like talking a bit about this internally. And it's so interesting that there's something very um, intuitively, very like viral, you know, like we were joking about this in one session. And then, you know, immediately you could see the team started talking about like, oh, yeah. Like I'll send you ten clouds for cloud health, for example, right? Like th there's something there that's very playful. Um, and again, if you combine this with some form of utility within the repo, uh, we we think that there is something very interesting. But nothing nothing to announce yet. But maybe just to to have a final thought on that. Um, what we really think that is going to happen is what started as a social network for developers, like GitHub, now is becoming. Also, you know, the place where eventually developers will be starting their own companies. Their whole monetization, you know, will live in, in one of those companies. So we really, you know, want to actually, you know, take that to the extreme and see, like, observing what, what interesting is going on, uh, what, what is interesting on the, on the Ethereum world, on the DeFi world, and then repurpose those, bring them back to the developer and basically allow developers to make a living. So you should expect a number of features, not one or two still more of a playground let's see what sticks let's see what doesn't cool i just wanted to ask a, a, a last a last question of, of alexis so i i remember even in the beginning when, when i met you you were working on sort of as a hobby on some bitcoin client in rust and then for the longest time you guys were actually thinking of creating your own blockchain uh for a radical based on proof of work which, which I think was very contrarian thing, right? Where basically everyone was building new blockchains on, on various types of proof of stake systems, or maybe in term, maybe as uh, Ethereum smart contracts. And now you guys are building uh, on Ethereum as well. So I'm just curious to hear, like, what is your thinking personally on, you know, kind of the role and importance of Bitcoin uh, as well as the role and importance of Ethereum? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's, that's like a very open-ended question, but I'm going to try to to say smart things. Um, so the, the first thing is that um, Ethereum offers us things that are kind of um, hard to do without, right? Um, we mentioned in the beginning, like uh, stable coins, right? Like developers want to receive donations or support and pay support using stable coins. And so that's something that um, at the moment only Ethereum really offers. The problem, however, and, and the reason why um, we originally wanted to uh, build a proof of work chain is for security. And because we were doing, um, you know, we were doing this OS rank thing that we just mentioned on chain, right? And you can't do that on, uh, as a smart contract. It's too expensive. It needs to happen at the layer, on layer one, essentially. So, you know, we were, we were exploring, um, you know, proof of work 
you know, due to the requirements of uh, um, having a light client. Um, one of the things I still really dislike with Ethereum is the centralization around things like Infura, right? Like it's it's today it's impossible to run a, a, an Ethereum full node on your laptop or even on your desktop, and there are no real light clients that are usable. Uh, you know, part of this is because uh, the light client technology is uh, even even though Ethereum is a proof of work chain at the moment, still you know creating the the right proofs um, for a system that allows complete freedom and prog programmability is really, really hard. And so one of the things I would like to see is actually some kind of integration of Bitcoin into Radical, you know, maybe something around the Lightning Network um, to do instant payments for very, very cheap to developers, um, something that on Ethereum is looking more and more um, problematic due to the, the the price of gas, right? Um, so I think in, in the end, we're going to see sort of, um, you know, Ethereum uh, shining for its connectivity and, and integration of all the different kind of smart contracts, you know, the, the, the liquidity around all these different tokens, the programmability, um, the ability to, you know, even maybe connect your, your, your donations to something like, uh, um, like Compound to, to gain some yield and things like that. You can do really interesting things. But for simple payments, uh, for cheap payments, um, I'm still kind of looking at things like Lightning. And for people who are also are paranoid or um, you know, don't want to trust uh, a third party to, to verify payments, um, again, something like Bitcoin and Lightning would work better, in my opinion. Maybe if I, if I can add on that. Uh, yeah, I think everything Alexei said is, is right. The point that I want to communicate here is that, you know, we're not, we're not maxis, like, you know, we're not maximalists, like we really like, you know, see value in different approaches, right? Uh, so we have a specific vision that we're going after and we realize through user sessions that this vision is relevant to a lot of people, not only to the Bitcoin or Ethereum community, but, you know, also to other other big blockchain ecosystems. Like we have a lot of, you know, friends that are excited about us on the Cosmos ecosystem, for example, same story, you know, with parity. So all I'm trying to say here is that we, we, um, we have certain principles in mind, but beyond those principles, we really like you know try to see what is needed and like you know what is requested from 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 our users um and then basically you know work work around that uh, obviously you know one of the benefits that we see with ethereum is that we feel that right now everyone will interoperate with ethereum so immediately ethereum opens you up to this you know wider developer developer ecosystem but as alexis said you know there's also a trade off there so yeah long story short we we really you know keeping our eyes open we're really working with our users and then you know if, if if what we're working on is relevant for more and this is you know something that our users want we will actually work on that and and bring that to more ecosystems cool well thanks so much for uh, for joining us today guys it's, it's been great to hear uh, about the, the progress and to see kind of the upcoming you know ethereum integration and uh, yeah, i am really excited and of course to our listeners I uh, encourage everyone to like check it out, especially developers right, play around with it. I think Sonny already played around with it upstream and uh, he liked it. So um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, Brian, Sonny. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.